welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on the different cells in bone tissue and how they work together. Bone tissue is connective tissue, a specialized connective tissue. Let's go back a little and look at the general structure of connective tissue. It's got cells and an extracellular matrix, which includes protein fibers like collagen and elastin and ground substance. The ground substance includes glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and adhesive glycoproteins. Now what these actually are depends on the type of connective tissue. But in connective tissue proper, which is your general connective tissue, the main resident cells are fibroblasts and fibrocytes. Fibroblasts come from mesenchymal stem cells. Fibroblasts are the ones that synthesize all this matrix stuff. Fibrocytes are a less active version of fibroblasts. Some cells like monocytes can migrate into connective tissue if they've got some work to do. Bone is specialized connective tissue. It's supportive. It's special because this extracellular matrix is calcified, meaning it's got these kinds of organic components, but also inorganic stuff, predominantly calcium hydroxyapatite. The cells in bone are osteoblasts and osteocytes. The stem cells that can form these osteoblasts are osteoprogenitor cells or osteogenic cells. The fourth type of cell is an osteoclast and it's derived from monocytes, possibly by the fusion of monocytes. Those are the four main types of cells in bone tissue and now we're going to look at what they all do and how they work together. The osteoprogenitor cells or the osteogenic cells are derived from the mesenchyme. They are stem cells, so they can differentiate into other cells, and here that will be the osteoblast. If you look at the shaft or the diaphysis of a long bone, they usually have a medullary cavity with the cancellous bone around them. The trabeculae of the cancellous bone are lined by endosteum. It lines all the marrow spaces. Around the cancellous bone is compact bone and the outer layer is periosteum. This endosteum and periosteum, they have cellular layers where these osteogenic cells reside and when needed, they can differentiate into osteoblasts. So they are important for bone growth and repair. Osteoblasts are the fibroblast equivalent in bone tissue. They can synthesize all the extracellular matrix proteins. What do they form? The protein fibers are like collagen. Bone has predominantly type 1 collagen. It's got the 1 in it, that's how you remember it. Bone has type 1 collagen. Adhesive glycoproteins like osteocalcin and osteonectin, which bind avidly to calcium and are thus important for bone mineralization. This matrix that's synthesized by osteoblasts is called osteoid. It's bone matrix with the protein components, but it's not calcified yet. That osteoid undergoes mineralization, where inorganic components like calcium hydroxyapatite get added to it, and that forms the calcified bone matrix. The bone matrix has both organic and inorganic components. The organic part of the bone matrix gives it tensile strength. The inorganic part gives it compressional strength, so they're both important for bone strength. Osteoblasts are the ones that synthesize all the proteins for the extracellular matrix. That's basically the osteoid, so osteoblasts synthesize the osteoid. This process of mineralization is also regulated by the osteoblasts. Osteoblasts also produce cytokines, like the macrophage colony stimulating factor, and the receptor for the activation of nuclear factor kappa B ligand. Now this stuff sounds like gibberish for now, but we will come back here. Osteoblasts are clearly very active cells, and as such, these cuboidal cells have got lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum and a well-defined Golgi apparatus. Some of the osteoblasts undergo apoptosis once their job is done. Some remain as bone lining cells. But while they synthesize the osteoid, some of them get trapped in that newly forming matrix. They differentiate, and these cells are now called osteocytes. So osteocytes are more mature cells and they're not very active. They have lesser rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. They sit inside lacunae, which are spaces in the bone matrix that houses these cells. 
they have cytoplasmic extensions that are in the spaces called canaliculi. Mature bone is lamellated. It's got layers and layers of matrix, and these cells sit in those lacunae trapped between the layers with those cytoplasmic processes inside canaliculi. Between the cells, we have the calcified bone matrix, which isn't going to allow diffusion. But the canaliculi have some extracellular fluid, and that allows exchange to happen with the cells. The cytoplasmic processes have gap junctions, which helps connect the cells so that they can communicate. Osteoblasts have gap junctions too. Ions like calcium can move between the cells through these gap junctions, and this forms the osteocytic membrane system. Together, the cells in this system work like a mechanosensor, sensing the load on the bone and deciding what to do next. Osteoblasts synthesize bone matrix, and osteocytes maintain it. Osteoprogenitor cells can form these osteoblasts when required. Bone in the body is very much alive. It's a dynamic structure, and as such, both synthesis and resorption of bone happens. Synthesis of bone matrix is by the osteoblasts. Resorption of the bone matrix, which would be destroying it, is by osteoclasts. The fourth type of cell is the osteoclast. The osteoclasts are derived from monocytes, possibly by the fusion of monocytes. So they are multinucleated giant cells. There are different kinds of giant cells that you'll come across while studying physiology and pathology. Some of them are physiological. Most of them are actually pathological. The osteoclast, however, is a good example for a physiological giant cell. The fact that it comes from the monocyte macrophage system makes sense because its job is to resorb bone. Osteoclasts are regulated by osteoblasts. Remember those cytokines that osteoblasts produce? They guide formation and proliferation of osteoclasts. Macrophage CSF, the rank ligand. They bind to the osteoclast precursor cells and would increase mature osteoclast formation. The rank ligand would bind to the rank receptor on the osteoclast precursor cells. Another cytokine is osteoprotegerin. Now this binds to the same receptor and stops the rank ligand from binding to those cells and thus would inhibit pre-osteoclasts from becoming mature osteoclasts. It's thus also called the osteoclastogenesis inhibitory factor. Now what happens once the osteoclast is active? It has a ruffled border where it makes contact with the bone, forming a circumferential seal. The attachment is mediated by adhesive glycoproteins. The integrins on the osteoclast bind to vitronectin on the surface of bone. The space beneath that border forms the sub-osteoclastic zone because it's beneath the osteoclast. The depression it creates as it digests bone becomes larger and larger. This depression where the osteoclast sits is called the Hauship lacuna or the resorption bay. It's got lots of nuclei and other organelles in the basal zone. It has a clear zone with actin filaments on the sides of the ruffled border and a vesicular zone with lysosomes and vesicles with enzymes meant to digest bone. Remember that bone matrix is organic and inorganic. The organic part has proteins like collagen fibers, and the inorganic part has minerals like calcium hydroxyapatite. The osteoclast has carbonic anhydrase. Carbon dioxide combines with water, and with this enzyme it forms carbonic acid, a familiar reaction in physiology. That then forms bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate leaves the cell in exchange for chloride, but what happens to the hydrogen ions? The hydrogen ions are pumped into the sub-osteoclastic zone by a hydrogen ATPase pump, where it creates an acidic environment, breaking down calcium hydroxyapatite. The calcium and phosphate ions are then released into the bloodstream. So bone resorption increases the plasma calcium levels by taking calcium out of the bone. If we take an example of the parathyroid hormone, which is important for calcium regulation in the body, it causes bone resorption, which would be by the osteoclasts, but those cells don't have a receptor for this hormone. The osteoblast has a receptor for the parathyroid hormone. 
that increases the release of cytokines which bind to the osteoclast precursor cells and convert them to mature osteoclasts. They restore bone, releasing calcium and increasing the calcium levels in blood. That's how the parathyroid hormone can use bone resorption to restore blood calcium levels when they're low. But bone also has those organic components like collagen and ground substance. The osteoclast vesicles have enzymes like acid phosphatase, acid hydrolases, matrix metalloproteinases like collagenase, which digest those organic components when they're released again into that sub-osteoclastic zone. The osteoclast has now resorbed bone. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts work together, and that helps bones change shape, grow, and repair. Bones can grow longitudinally, but also radially. If we ignore longitudinal growth for now, bones increase in girth, so radially, by appositional growth. If this is the medullary cavity surrounded by cancellous bone, the marrow spaces are all lined by endosteum. But to make it simpler, I'm just going to draw it as the inner lining of bone. It's got cells. The cell we need for this is the osteoclast, the bone digester. Around cancellous bone is compact bone, and then the periosteum. Again, it has cells. What we need now are the osteoblasts. As the osteoblasts lay down new bone, the osteoclasts resorb bone from the center, increasing the thickness of the diaphysis while increasing the size of the medullary cavity. That's how bones undergo modeling. That's bone modeling. But throughout life, bones undergo remodeling. In response to the different stresses and strains that they're subject to, bone gets destroyed, bone gets formed. This again involves the balance between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. There are five key steps in a remodeling cycle. The first is activation, where osteoclast precursors are recruited and then activated. What do they do? Resorb bone. So that's the next step, bone resorption. Then those osteoclasts undergo apoptosis. We don't need them anymore. The next step is reversal. Now we move from resorbing bone to forming bone. The cell we need for that is the osteoblast. Osteoblasts then do the next step of bone formation, which includes osteoid formation and then mineralization of the bone matrix. During that process, some of the osteoblasts get trapped and differentiate into osteocytes. Once mineralization is done, we reach the final step of termination, where osteoblasts which haven't gotten trapped either undergo apoptosis or they remain as bone lining cells. That is how bones undergo remodeling, by using all those bone cells. So the osteogenic cells are the creators. The osteoblasts are the builders, the osteoclasts are the destroyers, and the osteocytes are the prisoners. Those are the cells of bone tissue, and they work together. I do hope this video was helpful. If it was, you can give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.